All right, what's going on guys? This is Rob and we are back again with The Legend of Blue Marvel, except this time we start to focus a little bit more on Connor Sims. So what we do is we jump back to 1953 at the Naval Amphibious Base in Little Creek, North Carolina during the Korean War. And what you have here is a fight that breaks out between Adam Brashear and Connor Sims and a few other guys. And that's because they had basically burned Adam Brashear in effigy, right? And as a result of that, Connor Sims has taken just a personal affront to that. Now, what this does is it's designed to show how close Adam Brashear and Connor Sims were, that they weren't really even just friends, they were more like brothers. And as a result of that, Connor Sims stated he would always have the back of Adam Brashear because Adam Brashear had saved his life. And so as a result of that, we switch back to the modern era, right, with this conversation between Adam and Stark and Reed, Hank Pym, these guys. And what happens is there's an amazing conversation that goes on here. Initially, like Tony Stark and those guys basically apologize and the response of Adam is, I don't need your apologies for what the federal government did to me 40 years ago, right? You weren't there. You didn't have a hand in it, right? I don't need your apologies for that, right? Let's just focus on the here and now. Let's focus on what needs to be done and let's just move forward from here. And so when they basically explain what had gone on with Anti-Man, the response of Adam is like, the Avengers can't handle it. And they're like, man, we're lucky we even made it out of that thing in one piece. We almost died fighting Anti-Man. So no, this is not a problem the Avengers can handle. Like we need some, like we need you in order to handle this. Now, of course, that's when the conversation between Adam and Reed Richards illustrates the idea that Anti-Man is basically a wormhole. He's a way by which the antimatter universe can actually cross over into the positive matter universe and destroy the positive matter universe. And so that's when Adam Brashear reveals the origin of both his powers and the powers of Connor Sims. And what it reveals here is that there was a, a basically a lab test that was being conducted by the federal government where they were looking to harness uh, antimatter energy as an infinite source of energy because the antimatter universe is an entire universe. So being able to harness that infinite source of energy would mean hopefully free energy for everyone forever across the entirety of the world. The problem with that is that antimatter energy is very difficult to harness according to Adam Brashear and impossible according to Reed Richards. And so ultimately the experiment went awry. Now, one of the things to focus on here is that Adam Brashear's stance is, no, the experiment just, just basically ended up going awry. It didn't work out the way that it hoped, but you can harness antimatter energy. You can create an antimatter reactor in the same way you can create a nuclear reactor and harness the splitting of the atom. The thing here is that with that whole device and everything going nuts, we barely made it out alive. But almost immediately after that, Connor Sims basically just kind of broke down and disappeared, right? He essentially just vanished. He says, but the reality is that there is like the, the idea of an antimatter reactor works. You're looking at it. I am a living antimatter reactor. The difference here is that Connor Sims is basically unstable. So the way to think about this is that Adam Brashear, if you were to use more realistic terms, Adam Brashear is a fully powered and fully working nuclear reactor. Connor Sims is a nuclear reactor that kind of works, but is more broken or unstable than anything else. You never quite know exactly how it's going to happen and how it's going to work. So basically, Adam Brashear achieved exactly what he set out to do. He's the, the perfect antimatter superhero that exists out there. Now, one of the things to also know here is that this is his initial introduction into Marvel Comics. And as with most superheroes who are introduced in comics, you get an early indication of what they can do with their powers, but over time, those powers will expand. And that's why in the modern era in Marvel Comics, the powers of Adam Brashear are largely believed to be limitless. And if given enough time, he could actually alter reality on a universal scale. What whether he'll get to that point, we don't fully know, but his powers are immense. It's why he was able to go toe to toe with somebody like Galactus, because it's just a limitless source of energy that he channels from, and he could use it in a variety of different ways. It's most commonly used for just your standard superhero powers, flight and speed, durability and invulnerability and so on and so forth, but his powers can be far more than that with the right kind of writer, and it can be done believably. And so as a result of this, the next time that Connor Sims had reappeared was when he and Adam Brashear were facing off against each other each other at the beginning of the story, and Adam Brashear's mask was torn and the whole country realized he was a black guy. But the response of Iron Man is, I get that that was a difficult thing for you, and I get that it's hard for you to face off against your best friend, and even ally yourselves with us in the face of everything that had happened, but the reality here is, we need your help. And where he responds and says, look, I, 
was told my services were no longer needed. The response of Ant-Man is, I still can't believe you actually followed that order and did nothing for all that time. You could have come out of retirement at any time. Things got progressively better after the King assassination. And the response of Adam Brashear is, were you there? Kumbaya did not happen overnight, Dr. Pym. People died for simply drinking from the wrong water fountain. Given the potential for a firestorm, if I appeared publicly, I couldn't take that chance. A race war would have forced everyone to choose sides, make foolish decisions that they didn't want to make, and that includes me. Laws exist for a reason, to prevent anarchy. And when Iron Man asks, well, are you simply just gonna turn your back? The response of Adam is one, I never said that I wouldn't help you guys. And two, don't ever put words in my mouth. But one of the things to notice here is that Adam Brashear is very hostile towards Reed and Hank and and uh, and Tony Stark. He's not very friendly to them. The, the question that Tony asks is like, what's with this guy's attitude, man? Like I thought he'd be happy. And of course, Hank kind of comes in initially and says, well, I mean, he's been a little out of practice for 40 years. And the response of Reed sort of observing everything and putting his intellect to the test here is saying like, it's not that simple, right? Think about it from his perspective. He was a prisoner and every aspect of his life had been affected and has been affected by that executive order, whether he wanted to believe it or not. And where initially Hank's like, that was a long time ago, Reed, right? Like, you know, things like that don't happen anymore. He needs to learn to get over it. The response of Reed is like, is that so? He's like, for one who's had his own bouts with anger issues, I'd have thought you'd been a little more empathetic to that. But let's really draw, let's, let's look at what's really going on here, right? Let's look at the bigger picture here. Reed kind of scales out and says, let's give you guys some perspective. And he says, you know, we say that kind of, of overt bigotry that we had 50 years ago doesn't exist anymore, but we all know better. Like look around our own community of superheroes, right? Let's just remove every other race in existence. Let's just look at superheroes for a second, right? The Avengers, the Fantastic Four, we're lauded as heroes, protectors of mankind. They give us parades and our honor. They approach us for endorsements and all kinds of stuff. But the X-Men, who are just as much the heroes as we are, are hated and feared. Have you ever asked yourself why? How does the world know that we're not mutants? Yet because of some warped perception and human idiocy, we get a pass while the X-Men are persecuted. And the response of Hank is like, well, they were born like that, Reed. And that makes people afraid of what they or their children could become. And the response of Reed is, but is that really a good excuse to hate on him? He's like, I admit, I never much cared about or even thought about mutant human affairs until Franklin was born. Because at this point in time when the comic was written, uh, Franklin was still considered a mutant in Marvel Comics. He says, as a mutant, there have been whole organizations and government institutions that have been built to destroy, quote unquote, his kind. And that's true, right? Friends of Humanity, The Right, different groups like that, Project Wide Awake in its entirety. The entire government has actually actively worked against the mutant population in order to contain and control it for fear of what the mutant population population might do if there are enough of them in the world. And he says, my son and now my daughter have done nothing wrong except for the fact that they exist. To coin a phrase, their skin is their sin, their DNA is their crime. And so of course, Tony chimes in and says, yeah, but I mean like other heroes have been persecuted too. Right? I mean, hasn't really been peaches and cream for any of us. And Reed says, I realize that, but look at the blue Marvel, Adam Brashear. Even after the cape comes off and the mask is put in the closet, even his humanity as a black man was still a problem. How would any of us feel if that happened to us? And that really is the crux of why Adam Brashear holds so much resentment here. It'd be different if it was a problem with his costume. It'd be different if his costume was offensive, but it wasn't the costume of Adam Brashear that was offensive to the federal government and the people in the in the positions of powers that be. It was just the nature of Adam Brashear himself. It was his skin color, something he couldn't control. And so as a result of that, Adam Brashear, of course, holds a lot of animosity. And so following that conversation, we switch over to Adam Brashear, traveling back to his base of operations down in the Mariana Trench, right? Because he actually operated down in the ocean. And that's really where his base of operations remained, even after this whole story came out. And in the middle of all this, he's actually met by Namor the Submariner. Now, what's really funny here is that where Reed Richards and Tony Stark and Hank Pym pitch this idea that like, well, the world's not as bad as it used to be, you know, things are different now, that Namor the Submariner actually takes a wholly different approach. He takes the opposite approach and he's just like, no. Right? Like the surface world are a threat to my people. You better believe if it came down to it, I would absolutely destroy the surface world. My people come first. That's the choice that I make. And it's a really interesting thing here because what Namor says is that when I was with the invaders, right? Captain America, the original Human Torch, Jim Hammond, Bucky Barnes, he says, we battled alongside red tail pilots who face constant ridicule and strife from both collaterals and superiors alike. Accused of being stupid, inferior, and unworthy, they had to follow 
orders. Yet they never turned their back when the call went out, and they were some of the bravest Americans I ever met. My point is, no matter what the odds are prayed against you, there is a larger picture to consider, even if it's only to inspire others to be great. You're sovereign of your own kingdom. The rules are simply different. And the response of Namor is, you forget yourself, Adam. Remember, in Atlantis, I was the outcast. I was the sub-Atlantean pariah, the pink-skinned crotta. That means pale crab in my tongue, amongst a world of blue skins. I did not hide my abilities, nor did I run. I stood strong for all to see. I ruled, and they called me crotta no more. And the response of Adam here is really intriguing. He says, don't be naive. They just don't say that to your face. And he says, be that as it may, they are still my people. And when the surface people attacked Atlantis, I made them pay for every drop of Atlantean blood that was spilled by attacking New York City. And so Adam responded to saying, just because you have power doesn't mean it should be abused. Besides, you can't condemn a whole race because of the actions of a foolish few. And when Namor asks who's being naive now, he makes this incredibly compelling point where he says, a foolish few left unchecked can become an evil many. 11 million died horribly. How many lives might have been saved had good men intervened earlier to stop that atrocity? And where Adam says this is different, you're asking me to make enemies of people who are my friends, people who have loved me regardless of my skin color. I can't even imagine what you're suggesting. The response, the final statement here offered by Namor is he says, Captain America, a surface dweller who was my oldest and dearest friend, who was as much akin to me as a brother, because remember by this point, Captain America's dead. He says, but where Atlantis is concerned, my people, friend or no, I would lay waste to the entire surface world to protect them. And he says, I'm trying to get you to understand the complexities of justice. If you want things to change, you're going to make enemies. There's no way you can invoke change in the world in any capacity and not make any enemies in the process. And so it's really, really, it's a, it's a phenomenal idea because what this does is it leads to Adam Brashear taking off to the moon, presumably to see the watcher, we're not entirely sure, but he's suddenly met by the arrival of Connor Sims. And the, the discussion between the two of them really breaks out insofar as there's a, a bit of a personal vendetta here in the sense that because of what Connor Sims became, because of how violent he became and how terrible he became, insofar as wanting to eliminate the entirety of humanity, right, or force humanity to change, that what Adam Brashear did is he actually organized the, the wife and child of Connor Sims to be moved to a safe location so Connor couldn't get to them. But Connor saw it as Adam Brashear standing in the way and actually preventing him, or at least taking away the things that meant the most to him. And so that's when Adam tells Connor, he says, things are better, Connor, not like they were in like the 60s. They're not perfect, but there are good people on all sides who were trying to come together, you have to believe in that. And the response of Connor is, that belief is misplaced, and you are naive for having it, Adam. He says, I've walked this world in the short time I've been back, and that is far from true. Everywhere I look, man still hates his brother, be it the South, the Far East, or the Middle East, it's all the same, Adam, and it's your weakness that allowed all of this. And when Adam asked the question, is it really my weakness that I chose peace over violence, the response of Connor is, no, it's because you chose to turn your back when it was within your power to stop this madness. Millions of your own people left to suffer under the yoke of oppression. Little girls who were burned in churches by professed believers. Men hung from trees like strange fruit because they dared to look their oppressors in the eye. If you had done something then, perhaps I would not have to do anything now. And that's really the crux and the nature of Connor Sims. One of the best things about this story is that Anti-Man is not some kind of villain of the weak guy. It's not, oh man, I have these kind of antimatter powers. And sure, I'm a little bit unstable in terms of my powers, but I'm gonna conquer the world because I love having power. No, it's not like that. And in fact, it's the other philosophical side of the equation, a more extreme equation, but still a logical equation, right? The stance of Connor Sims, and it's exactly what we talked about in the first video. The stance of Connor Sims is that if humanity wanted to change, humanity would have changed. There's nothing stopping the human race from changing, but right? it's not like Thanos used the 
Mind Stone and is forcing humanity to fight against itself, you know, based on petty squabbles like skin color or religious convictions or socioeconomic status, right? It's humanity that chooses to do that to itself. The stance of Connor Sims, at least in this story, is that's how people are. People don't want anything to get better, Adam Bashir, and your belief in the fact that they do is foolhardy. What you're doing here is you're looking for reasons to believe that humanity wants to be better in the face of the fact that they don't. Now, the other part of this equation is that Connor Sims has a huge negativity bias because if Adam Brashear is basically looking for reasons to believe why humanity is worth saving, Connor Sims is looking for reasons to believe that it's not. And so both of these guys, if, if we're being honest here, neither one of them is actually right. That the truth is they're both operating on two opposites, right? That you have Adam Brashear who's operating as an extreme optimist and you got Connor Sims who's operating as an extreme pessimist. The question that really has to be asked here is based on these two ideologies, if you had to choose one, which one would be right? I would argue that it's one of those things where if humanity truly wasn't worth saving, then there would be no volunteers. There'd be no charity. There'd be, there wouldn't be anybody out there doing anything that's good. The reality is that there are people who are doing that. Now, ultimately, Connor Sims gets the upper hand on Adam Brashear, knocks him unconscious and says, you had your time, Adam. You could have fixed the world. You could have made it better, but you chose not to. And so in the face of the fact that humanity will not fix itself, I will make humanity fix itself. With that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. Thank you all for watching, and I will catch you all later. Peace.